Good evening everyone, thank you very much for your patience. It's a very warm day so you might want to take your cardies and your jackets off because it might get a little warm in here. Welcome to a very special reading. Welcome to Paul Holmes for coming all the way down to Dunedin to talk about his latest book, Daughters of Erebus. We'd also like to um, thank Hashit New Zealand for bringing Paul down. It's fantastic that we have publishers who will bring authors down to the South Island so that we can actually and um, talk in person and discuss what we read. Um, and also thank you to Wick Horse George Street. We've got Alistair and Peter here who um, at the end will be um, available if you want to purchase a copy of the book and Paul will also be available for book signings. On the 28th of November 1979, an Air New Zealand DC-10 ploughed into the side of Mount Erebus, killing everyone on board. The tragedy has never left the hearts and minds of New Zealanders. Most remember where they were when the news went public. Neither has the controversy surrounding the appointment of blame upon the pilots. It seems fitting that broadcaster Paul Holmes should be the man to re-examine the case in, this, in his book, Daughters of Erebus. Ever since his first television guest, American skipper Dennis Connor, walked off set, he has shown he is unafraid of controversy and is willing to stand up for what he believes in. In his book, not only does he look back at the original verdict and ensuing inquiry, but at the human toll. The official verdict left the families of the pilots alone to honour the memories of their husbands and fathers. Justice Mahone stood alongside them in his report. Now Paul Holmes honours them all with his latest book. Everyone please welcome Paul Holmes. Thank you Lynette and uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen and thank you very much for coming. Um, I've got to tell you, I've got a post-prostate, I can get very hot in a hot room, so you've got to forgive that about me, so I've got tissues. And I've also got a runny nose these days, too, for some reason. Now, forget it, it's leaking me, too. <laughs> and I'm not eating properly at home, either. Since um, my wife stopped cooking, since Sunny Bill became an all-black. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I went home last night and said to... We, we had one in Napier last night, a, a talk in Napier. And um, I went home and said that I said that she was a poor. <laughs> she should make lovely salmon and asparagus for us. Well, uh, Lynette, you put it in a nutshell, really. Um, the confusion still reigns. And that is the damnedest thing about the story. It is the damnedest, simplest thing, and yet confusion still reigns, I think, in the public mind. <clears throat> and the main thing I've tried to do in Daughters of Erebus, Maria couldn't stand the title, she had to tie her up to get to sign a bit of paper. But she's, she's fine now. I'll let her out soon. The main thing I've tried to do is to defuse, if you like, is to, uh, to keep it simple, to make the story simple. The simple story simple. As Lynette says, at 10 seconds before 10 to 2 in the afternoon of November 28, 1979, a New Zealand DC-10, under the command of Captain Jim Collins, collided at 480 kilometres an hour with the lower slopes of Mount Erebus on Ross Island, Antarctica. All 257 people on board were killed instantly, killed before they even knew there had been impact by the shock waves, which go faster than nerve ends, nerve the nerve speed. The bodies of many of the people on board, the souls on board, were shattered beyond recognition, or they were burnt in the fierce fire that erupted towards the top of the crash site. The crash site itself extended some 700 metres up the slope from the point of impact, <clears throat> it was very about a 14, 15 degree uh, angle. The, the mount, and the plane was on 14, 15 too, so the plane hit in the belly. Its belly hit and broke, and the, and the belly left a two metre indentation in that ancient ice. Um, it was a terrible mess, and those who saw the wreckage have never forgotten the sight, and those who saw the wreckage also say they could not believe it had once been a DC 10. Uh, there was national, and that was one of the difficulties for people working the crash site too, was the wind would come up and pick these fragments that the DC-10 had become up, and they could, couldn't touch its throat, these sharp little shards of aluminium and so forth. Excuse me. There was, of course, national and international shock. The Antarctic flights have been very popular, 
and they were splendidly democratic affairs. I've worked out actually why it is that even though there were only, you know, we're a country of what, 3 million people at the time, uh, even though they were only relative to that number, 257 people, I've worked out where everyone seems to think they knew someone on board, and I think that's because the flights were so splendidly democratic affairs. They weren't the domain of rich old men. Uh, they were terribly popular, uh, but people won them in raffles. You know, rugby club would, would, would buy a couple of tickets and, and raffle them off. So all kinds of people ended up on these Antarctic flights. A mother and dad might reward good exam results. I know from near Hastings, a place called Clive, there was a couple and their daughter, I think, had just been accredited UE, and so they shouted themselves into her on the flight. And some of the stories like that are just so poignant. There's a book in, in those stories, I think, actually. Um, it might be a birthday treat. So everyone got to go, you know, had the possibility of going, and the, and the likelihood of going on this flight. What caused the accident to happen? <clears throat> it was quickly established that there had, as you know, that there had been uh, nothing wrong with the aircraft. It had been flying normally until the uh, moment of the crash. No engine had fallen off. There had been no massive depressurisation. No cargo door had blown off. An engine had not fallen off. Nothing like that. The pilot, a man of 45, tell me that's a clock and not a cell phone. <laughs> the pilot, a man of 45 years old, with a wife and four loving daughters, wife Maria, daughters Catherine and Elizabeth, uh, Pip and Dee Dee, and 11,000 flying hours was rated one of the most cautious men in the fleet. And since I've done this book, I've heard time and again from cabin crew who said we were always happy when we found out Jim Collins was in command. Jim would get you home. Jim would always get you down. It's a the emergency where I think lightning struck an air conditioning unit or door or something uh, coming out of Los Angeles back in the early 70s and he got everyone down, dumped the fuel and got the plane down. He was a cool man. As the title suggests, ladies and gentlemen, this book is The Girl's Story of their waiting that night for the news of the missing aircraft and of their surviving, getting through those bleak weeks and months after his death. Then, of course, months later, having endured his loss, the girls, and I'm talking about the Casson family as well. As a matter of fact, it was so moving last night in Napier uh, because Greg Casson, the flying officer Greg Casson was the co-pilot and uh, Greg Casson's sister was, was there and she stood up and thanked me very much for doing the book. And another sister sent a nice letter thanking me, so it was wonderful. So months later, of course, having endured the loss of their father, the Collins girls, they then had to bear the ignominy of his being blamed for the crash by the Chief Inspector of Air Accidents, Ron Chippendale. Their sense of injustice is as strong now as it was then, and I'm talking the pilot's wife, Maria, and the four girls. It's also the story of another woman who would become, in her own way, a daughter of Erebus, a woman whose unwarranted burden is Erebus, says her son, uh, Margarita Mann, wife of a judge. But this book is also, and I felt it necessary to be so, a serious examination of what really caused the accident. Man, did that require the reading. Ron Chippendale, the Chief Inspector of Air Accidents, found, after seven months of a secret inquiry, in which he, on his own, in which he never revealed who his sources were, found that it was pilot error. The pilots, he said, did not know where they were. By the way, Chippendale was a 4,000 hour man, Collins was an 11,000 hour man, and Casson, I think, was a 7 or 8,000 hour man. The pilots, he said, didn't know where they were. The pilots had broken the company altitude restrictions. They were too low and too dodgy weather. It was classically irresponsible flying, and if they'd bothered to look at their radar, it would have shown them the mountain. The pilot had carried on at low level towards bad weather with a mountain in it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what he's saying is, Collins was suicidal <coughs> and was about to try and murder 256 people. <laughs> For a start, ladies and gentlemen, they don't give DC 10 jobs to blokes who fly like that. When his report, and of course, again, and it's one of the first things that Mann began to ponder later on, was that verdict, that decision, did not marry at all with what we knew of the reputation of these airmen. When his report was published, the public were appalled at Captain Collins. As the Chief Inspector reached the end of his considerations, right towards the end, actually, just before, uh, well, just before his report was published, public pressure had mounted for there to be a full public inquiry into the disaster. This was the worst loss of life 
in New Zealand history. And at the time, it was the fourth worst air accident in aviation history anywhere in the world. The Prime Minister, Robert David Muldoon, decided to appoint a Royal Commission. We know that he expected a fellow who would do the right thing by the government and the airline and civil aviation, and we know that because of the anger of his outbursts immediately after the release of the Royal Commission report. But chosen to head to this Royal Commission came Gandalf the Grey. <coughs> I call him Gandalf the Grey in the book. He's a miracle how he came along. And uh, they appointed a judge of impeccable integrity, uh, of serious braininess, <coughs> Justice Peter Mann. Now, just before he began his hearings, the government, <coughs> the owner of the airline, having seen the report and the damage it did to the dead pilots, and against the request of Mann, released the Chippendale report. They were not obliged to do so, but they did anyway. They, of course, then had a royal, you know, with the, the, the danger being they were about to prejudice the Royal Commission hearings. Essentially, the Chippendale report left the airline, excuse me, and civil aviation off the hook. And the headlines from the release of the Chippendale report had a tremendous effect on public opinion. The headlines were devastating to the pilots. They resonate still, they reverberate still in the minds of New Zealanders. They were devastating to the pilot's wife and children, who watched their father take the blame, and it went into the public mind. Pilot in wrong place, pilot's too low, radar would have seen the mountain. There were headlines like, and I've seen them, I got them in scrapbooks. Crew uncertain as plane neared slope. Flight thousands of feet too low. The aircraft radar should have seen the mountain. At this point, <coughs> this book of mine, and it's bothered me all the way through it. I wish they had a different name now in New Zealand. You know? I wish you were Air Aotearoa or something like that. Because this is not an attempt to damage our national airline. The airline today is managed by enlightened and caring people. Uh, and you'll know the wonderful service we get which over around the country. Uh, and the old airline was admirable too. It had some 8,500 very decent, hard-working employees, dedicated people, it is even family people really, because it is a family. Uh, but, it, uh, but, but the old New Zealand of 1979, also had a board and a few people at the senior levels of flight operations uh, who decided that uh, the Chippendale report suited them just fine. And they decided to bluff or lie their way through the Royal Commission, or to put it crudely, to take the piss out of the Royal Commission under oath. When Mar was appointed Royal Commissioner, he read the Chippendale report a few times, he tells us in Virgo Erebus, and he thought it sounded entirely reasonable. And he imagined the Royal Commission would more or less rather stamp it. But over a few weeks, he'd be back on the golf course. Chippendale was first to give evidence. He was on the stand for many days, I think, on memory, eight days. At the end of his evidence, Mann congratulated him on being an exemplary witness. What no one realised, and what would gradually become apparent to the court and to Mann and to everyone else, was that it was all nonsense. He was making it up. Do you know the curious thing now? It took me months and months to realise this. I had a whole, whole couple of volumes of selected transcripts, actually the stuff that Mum was going to take the Court of Appeal uh, to uh, Privy Council, I think. Uh, key, key moments from the Royal Commission. And if you read, and you read the senior management people, and you can see the stonewalling, God, you read it and you long for a straight answer. And when I read Chippendale, I felt exactly the same thing. Oh, yes. Right at the start, Mann tells us in Verdict on Erebus, the book he wrote about the Royal Commission, he gets a peculiar call, he doesn't say who from, doesn't even give you an indication. I don't know, I have no evidence, but I have a feeling it might have been Jim McClay. Jim McClay always looked after him. Mann tells us he got a call from Wellington from a bloke who by the nature of his job, says Mann, knew what he's talking about, telling him that in the end, this commission was going to be all about who he believed. There was nothing technical to this, you know. Excuse me. It was all going to be about whom Mann found credible, and indeed, two groups, very on, early on in this World Commission, two groups began to emerge, opposed, they were, to each other. The senior executive pilots and the navigation staff uh, versus the line pilots, people like Jim Collins. Central to the crash, Mann understood very quickly, however, and it was quite simple to Mann, 
central to the crash, Mann started to see was the destination waypoint coordinates, he called it that term, the final point south, before he tooled around and then he came back. Uh, where am I? Central to the crash was the change in the destination waypoint coordinates, which were changed in the early morning, 2.16 a.m., on the day the flight took off, and the pilots had not been told. They changed where he was going, and they didn't tell him. To Man, this became the single dominant and most effective cause. It was the one component that was there from takeoff. And I find it unassailably logical. Collins and Casson had been briefed three weeks before their flight uh, with uh, three other pilots who were going to Antarctica. Collins and Casson had been briefed three weeks before their flight on November 9, in 1979, they'd been briefed, on a route straight down the safety of the middle of McMurdo Sound, the military route, the chute, the Americans called it, nice and safe over the flat sea ice of McMurdo Sound. And why wouldn't you go that way? Why would you go over an erupting volcano. <clears throat> the crews of the briefing were all shown an example of the digital flight plan printout used on the Antarctic flight two days earlier. That clearly showed the destination was right up the head of McMurdo Sound, not McMurdo Base, not McMurdo, not McMurdo Base, McMurdo Sound, the West Daly Island, very <coughs> the sea, right at the top of McMurdo Sound. Collins appears, we're fairly certain of this, Collins appears to have taken a copy of that flight plan home. The other pilots, and, and, and I'll explain why we know that later on, and it was after the crash, the chief of flight ops asked another pilot to go around and read Collins and try and find the flight plan. The other pilots at that briefing all testified under oath of the Royal Commission that that flight plan was straight down McMurdo Sound with the mountain safely out to the left, about 40 kilometres away. Chip and I said they're all liars, more or less. He never took statements from people chipped up. So that when he went to the Royal Commission, he could say, no, he didn't tell me that before. Oh, yes. He took two statements from two Americans. They're the only written statements I believe he made. Uh, right. So that meant that he was straight down the Meadow Sound uh, with the mountains safely out to the left about 40 k's away. 40 k's away. But overnight, before Jim Collins' flight, as I say, the navigation section changed the destination waypoint, which the crew put into its in-flight computer. Uh, the effect was to program the aircraft not straight down over the flat sea ice, but straight down the Erebus, by the Mount Cook. You might say to me, and I said this very early on, well, why didn't he get his maps out and just check the, you know, on, on the map? Well, the point was, that was an operational procedure. You got to your flight an hour before you left. That gave you time to check all your systems and so forth. It shouldn't have to need to check your destination waypoints and so forth on a map. Why second guess the navigation section? Why have a navigation section if you're going to do that? In any case, as we shall see, Jim Collins had done that the night before. Chippendale knew that the pilots had not been told, but he said he found no evidence that it had misled the pilots. Does a crash not do it? <laughs> Mislead was spelled M-I-S-L-E-A-D, by the way. And anyway, that's how Chippendale dealt with that inconvenience. Well, it doesn't exist. With respect, said Mann, paragraph 77, I think, the chief inspector's position is untenable. We know the change misled Jim Collins for two reasons. Because the night before his flight, these two older girls, Catherine and Elizabeth, they were touring around watching the telly, doing a bit of work. It was a Tuesday night he was doing this, but the flight was a Wednesday. The night before his flight, the two older girls saw him working on a couple of maps with plotting instruments. In other words, conscientiously, Jim Collins was planning and visualising his flight as any thoroughly professional airman would do. He showed the girls, in fact, he put the big map, great big map, over a metre long, on the floor, spread it out on the floor, and uh, Elizabeth remembers vividly, the sea was greenish colour, a paley green colour, and the Grant land uh, was uh, the you know the terrain was kind of purple, uh, and he showed the girls where he would fly, straight down the Murray Sound. The girls were in fact right down the coast of Victoria Land, down so the people on the right hand side to get the view going there, and he turned around and go up Victoria Land so the people on the left hand side got the view coming back. So, uh, therefore, we know therefore that Collins was exactly sure of his position. 
because he was right on the track that he or his co-pilots programmed into his in-flight computer. A computer they had flown and flown and depended on for thousands of safe hours. The Area Inertial Navigation System. It was marvellous. It was so accurate. Civil Aviation, of course, made a point to say, no, you can't rely on it. No, Civil Aviation. But coverage. True. It was so accurate that the guys flying up to Honolulu at night would suddenly, all their beepers would start going off because their brother aircraft coming back at 2,000 feet above them, um, would, um, you know, their, their inertial navigation system would set up little lights and so on. One was above the other. It was so accurate. It checked your position six times per second. Wonderful things. Uh, right. So we know he was on the track that he programmed into his in-flight computer, one he had flown for many thousands of hours. Every time he deviated from that track as he descended uh, t towards what he thought was McMurdo Sound, he returned the aircraft to the nav track. Uh, he was always on autopilot, but he took it off the nav track, put on heading select, which is where you just turn a knob and the plane will go left or right, whatever. Um, and, but he would put it onto nav track. Therefore, in his mind, he was straight down McMurdo. He would not have done that if he thought he was at 1,500 feet on track to a 13,000 foot mountain, would he? And as the fates would have it, I know there's some debate about this, but the entrance to Lewis Bay, where he was, looked from his height exactly like the entrance to McMurdo Sound, so there was that factor as well. It, it wasn't bad weather, it wasn't the most beautiful weather either. It was like a, like a Dunedin winter's day probably, a cloud to 2,500, 3,000 feet, you could fly under it, absolutely. Now, <laughs> it calls for the... <laughs> Maria Collins had told Chippendale, and I believe Maria, because she's not a liar. Maria's not a liar. She's appalled at the lies that started to happen. Maria Collins had told Chippendale, just weeks after the accident, December 14, when he came out of her house, about Jim Collins working on his maps and showing the girls. Chippendale dealt, dealt her with that inconvenience of the charts evidence also very well. He simply failed to mention it in his report. Later, after Marne's report had been released and the Court of Appeal had given Marne a thumping, Chippendale released a rambling 19-page single-spaced press release. In it, he said the girls' evidence about the charts could not be right because Jim didn't have any maps of the area. They'd uh, gone to the, they'd investigated the places he could have bought the maps and uh, they didn't have maps available and so uh, Jim couldn't have had the maps. He effectively accused the girls of perjury. But we know exactly what maps Jim Collins had that night and how he acquired them. Chippendale knew how he got the big American chart and said nothing, so he lied. And I got the happy day that's in the book. I got the documents. I got all the documents. It's all in the book. In his report, Chippendale gave the impression Collins was flying in cloud. Or at least towards an area of poor visibility. Actually, in his interim report, which the families could challenge, he put cloud, I think, and then, by the time he reached his final report, uh, three months later or seven months later, he had put flying towards an area of poor visibility. The pilot carried on at low level flying towards an area of poor visibility. But now came another shock for man. There were some 200 cameras on that flight because it was a sightseeing flight, and people wanted to take their pictures and their slides and so forth, and little movies and videos and bring them back and show people. So there were 200 odd cameras on the flight. And when the pictures were developed, it was obvious they were flying in clear air. Curiously, no photos were ever produced that were taken to the south. There were several opportunities the passengers had for photos to the south. Uh, Mr. Chippendale never produced any. The south being where the mountain was hiding, of course. And some 13 times on that tape, the 30 minute tape, after beginning their descent, their, spy, their orbiting descent, both the uh, figure eight descent, really, uh, both the captain and the first officer tell each other and McMurdo that they were flying visually. Descending visually, we have the ground, Collins at one point says, meaning the sea. We can see what's going on. That uh, they were flying, they, so they tell each other, they affirm to each other that they're flying visually. They were, and they, was, they were flying as a team, so professional. That was the other thing. Uh, not skylarking, not clowning at all, which is a lovely impression created by certain mistress types. They were flying visually as requested to do by McMurdo. Chippendale declared that Collins and Casson were in breach of the altitude rules the airline had established with civil aviation. And indeed, strictly speaking, Collins probably was. But um, the only, really, 
one of the problems I had with the, in the book is that I bring my mentor, who I acknowledge at the front, Stuart McFarlane, who spent eight years, didn't come home for dinner for eight years researching errors. And they published a book that no one bought because it was like an encyclopedia. It's like a Pears encyclopedia, <laughs> you know. But it, it's a wonderful, wonderful resource. And he does nothing without there being evidence. And, um, and I thought, no one made any fuss about altitude until the accident. And then it became the mantra for Chippendale, for the airline, and for civil aviation. But evidence began to emerge very quickly at the Royal Commission <coughs> that no flights since 1978, and probably not even the first two, had observed those altitude rules. They were sightseeing flights. You had to get down, the windows weren't very big so people could get their pictures. <coughs> and there were so many produced at the inquiry. I mean, it's, it was a joke. So many newspaper and magazine articles that it was impossible to accept the airline's denials that it knew nothing of low-level flight. As Martin observed one day at the Royal Commission, in a dialogue with counsel assisting the Commission, David Barrett one the airline had one arrangement with civil aviation, but the big question was what arrangement did the airline have with its pilots? And they're all going down to anywhere between 1,500 and 3,000 feet. But again, the altitude would not have mattered, said Mann, wouldn't have mattered a jot if the coordinates had not been changed without the pilot being told. Yeah. yeah. Do you know, Murray Davis, he loved cultivating big wigs. Murray was a big social climber, the chief executive. Even the days before, you know, first be fair and everything, Murray was always social, <laughs> social, <laughs> social. Then he had to be with the chief executive of the airline, that's cool. <laughs> but he, he made friends with Mr. John Brissenden. Mr. Brissenden was the president, no less, of the McDonnell Douglas Corporation of the United States of America at Long Beach, California. And Murray shouted Mr. Brissenden, his mate, a trip on an Antarctic flight. <coughs> and it so happened that uh, the flight that Mr. Brissenden went on was, was captained by one Captain Gordon Vetti, who became very prominent later on in the inquiry. And so Brissenden uh, has a drink with Murray, I suppose, and then goes back to the States and writes Murray a lovely letter and attaches to the letter an article of great praise he's written about his wonderful sightseeing flight on board a DC-10 around Antarctica at about 3,000 feet, without none there of us towering above them. And Air New Zealand took that and made a brochure which it sent with the article, which it sent to 900,000 New Zealand homes. No, never saw that, said Murray. No, no one had ever seen any of those articles. Have you seen this article in the Central Leader in Auckland? No, nope, never saw that. Uh, amazing. Where am I going here? Uh, right, so there you go. Um, so it was impossible to believe. But what finished this flight off was the weather. Something called Whiteout, upon which no Air New Zealand crew was briefed. It happened under overcast polar skies with the sun behind you. And it simply took all relief out of what was in front of you, if there were no sheds and stuff like that. Uh, mountains could simply disappear in front of you. Now, of course, people at the time said, oh, bullshit. What? No. It took a lot for us to believe that. Mom went down himself eventually and saw it as he approached the mountain. Could not believe it. In the book, I published a sequence of three photographs taken by Mr. Bob Thompson. May you remember, was Antarctic. DSI as Antarctic director at the time. Within 90 seconds, he, took, he takes three photos approaching Erebus by helicopter in a 90 second sequence, one every 30 seconds. The mountain is there, the mountain gets funny, next thing the mountain is gone. What's more, not only is it gone, but there's a whole flat expanse of white ahead of you, and there's even a false horizon. It's extraordinary, the photos are in the book. So, what Collins was seeing, you see, with this whiteout phenomenon, was exactly what he was expecting to see. A great flat expanse of white way into the distance. The flat sea ice of McMurdo Sound. <coughs> Except it wasn't. It was a mountain what had disappeared. <coughs> Another thing. Civil aviation had insisted that each captain would first have a supervised familiarisation flight to Antarctica before commanding his own flight because it was known. Polar flying is weird. As Mann observed, you know, when he went down there, even a topographical map, the place looks entirely different from your topographical map. You know, what's, what's sky, what's ice, what's land, what's sea, it's quite confusing, I would think. Um, in New Zealand, simply overrode that. CAD, 
commercial civil aviation did nothing about it. CAD, Mount said, the civil aviation, it was the civil aviation department, were up for millions anyway in private uh, action, said Mount and Bernard and Erebus, for having failed as the regulator. You know, our NZAF, our AAF, US Air Force and US Navy pilots must have three flights under supervision, pilots must have three flights under supervision before they can command their own flight to Antarctica. Uh, Chippendale knew quite a lot about Whiteout, actually. There's quite a lot about Whiteout in his report. But no, Whiteout had nothing to do with this. Whiteout, Whiteout mattered not to it. Collins was flying low level into an area of poor visibility in which there was a mountain. That's what he said. But of course, it wasn't poor visibility. It was perfect visibility, but it was a malevolent trick of the polar light. And Collins knew of no mountain ahead because he had been briefed. He was flying down at Meadow, and you don't brief a pilot one way and then send him another. We know this because of the cockpit voice recorder. What a wonderful witness that is. No one on that flight deck, in, 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 in the way it's not meant to be actually, we know this because of the copy voice recorder, because nobody on that flight deck, no one, and I worked out, I think, if I remember rightly from the book, because I, I can't remember half the book, that happened in the blur. Um, and there were five crew, well, there was Peter Mulgrew, of course, an Antarctic veteran. God, if anyone knew about the bloody weavers of the polar light, it was Peter Mulgrew. I mean, he first been to Antarctica with Hillary. Um, in 58. Uh, I worked out there were 95,000 flying hours between the two flight engineers and the pilot and the co-pilot. These were experienced men. Two pilots, two flight engineers, and none of them ever sees the mountain on that cockpit voice recorder. Not until, I don't know, about a minute from impact, perhaps a bit more, does anything seem strange to the crew. And uh, that's when uh, Gordon Brooks, the flight engineer, on duty flight engineer, there were two on the deck. Uh, says I don't like this and that's when things get underway and we prepare to fly out. But again, while Collins is deciding to fly out, they take their time deliberating which way to turn as they cautiously do, prudently do, because there's still no danger and there's nothing in front of them. They are being sucked into the god of chaos. The cockpit voice recorder, ladies and gentlemen. Daughters of Erebus spends a lot of time on the cockpit voice recorder. Two things I would say about the cockpit voice recorder. And, and I can believe this. Ma, I've never heard it. <coughs> Police locked it away for 80 years or something. Ma could not believe the appalling quality of the cockpit voice recorder. Apart from the voice, it's just a mess. It's a mess. It's a mess. And the galley, the, the, the flight deck door was open. The galley's right behind them. People are walking around saying, well, you don't know who was saying what. Uh, apart from the voices of the two pilots, says Ma, no other words and voices are clear on the cockpit voice recorder. It was a mess, and I have in the book, and I spoke at length to one of the DC-10 pilots, lovely man, Arthur Cooper, who went to Washington with the, with, uh, with, with, the, with the New Zealand team and worked on the original transcription. He was on the original transcribing team in Washington, DC. Arthur says it took us a half day to do Collins and Gasson. Half day, because the mic was straight above there, is it? It took the rest of the week to pick the guts out of the rest of it with any sense of exactitude. And they were told straight away, you know, they were given a briefing when they got up to the National Transportation Safety Board. You have to, to do this transcription successfully. You have to know the voices of the crew. You have to know the aircraft type. You have to know the airline's systems on the flight deck. You may not editorialise. You must not. It's not fair. You can't second guess. You can't make it up. You can't guess. And so all the way through there are they used the percentage sign for saying um, that they couldn't understand what was being said. And I was satisfied that was a fair and honest transcription. Chippendale, however, went off to Aria Farnborough in London with the tape and made his own transcript before he wrote his report. And it is his transcript that was presented to the Royal Commission. It is quite different from the original. Chippendale came back with 50 changes. Most of the changes he made to the words was to the detriment of the pilots. And later, when Marne went to London during the Royal Commission, 
He listened for himself, well, he listened at Washington too, and he listened uh, for himself with David Baraguan, and at Farnborough he listened with Mr. W.H. Tench, the brilliant British head of air accident investigation. Uh, and uh, they listened for themselves at, Farn at Farnborough, and none of them, for the life of them, could make out the words Chippendale said were there. As Mann wrote so lethally, it takes no skill to listen to a tape recording. But I know they were there, said Chippendale no later on, in this hysterical press release I was telling you about before. I know they were there, and I have hearing for flight level, you know, flight, flight crew level. But that CVR transcript, Chippendales, is the one, as I say, that was released publicly. That's one that made the headlines and went to the Commission of Inquiry. So something we had, <coughs> make up your mind soon, or what's wrong? Bit thick here, eh, Bert? You're a long while on instruments at this time. What English speaker speaks like that, I don't know. And there's no Bert anymore on the plane. None of it. Well, we know there was no Bert on the flight deck, said Chippendale, but there, there might have been someone nicknamed Bert. <laughs> All of it could have meant anything. Make up your mind soon could be, do you want coffee or tea? <laughs> do you want to sit here or over there? You know, any of it could have meant anything and be said by anyone or about whether you wanted to say tea or coffee. So Chippendale was dishonest, ladies and gentlemen. And then he wrote this extraordinary thing, that the flight engineers, I couldn't believe this when I read it, that the flight engineers, there's so much information in this old story, you know, sometimes it takes you months to see it. Then he wrote that the flight engineers were desperately trying to bring the pilots to their senses to fly responsibly. Now this was incredibly damaging to Collins. And in my book I say the following, that it was a lie, that it did not happen, it never happened. There is no such thing on the cockpit voice recorder, on his or the original. If you were trying to tell the pilot to straighten up and fly right, you'd say so, wouldn't you? You wouldn't say, a bit thick here, eh, Bert? <laughs> So Mann found that the pilots were actually not to blame for the crash. Chippendale was completely wrong. As Paul Davison, QC, who acted for Maria Collins and who acted for the Airline Pilots Association, said to me, dumb, wasn't it? Chippendale had all the pieces of the jigsaw and he put them together all wrong. Was he dumb? No, he wasn't dumb. He was known as a very smart man. Draw your own conclusions. Why would he have done a cover-up? It was the Muldoon years. It was so big, I suppose. Nobody alive wanted to take the blame. And this became apparent very early. Actually, do you know the incredible thing is that a couple of Air New Zealand staffers, one of whose wives was there last night too, a couple of Air New Zealand staffers, navigators, flight dispatchers, out at flight dispatcher at the airport, had worked out what had probably happened to the flight that very night, even before the wreckage was sighted. They cracked it by half past ten. Wreckage started half past midnight. The coordinates have been changed, and there's nothing on Captain Collins' flight plan, says Alan Dorte, who was working this out. There was nothing on Captain Collins' flight plan given to him in the morning to show that they had been told. And one of the two men who made this discovery made a very thorough report. Uh, it was published in certainly Farland's book, which not many people bought, back in 1991. I couldn't believe it when I read it. Air New Zealand buried it. Mann never saw it. They never sent it up to him. No document Mann ever got was an original. They were all copies. One thing is for sure, Maury Davis, the Chief Executive, when he heard about this dramatic news that the coordinates had been changed, the destination coordinates had been changed, and Captain Collins had not been told, that's when Maury Davis started shredding documents. Incredible. You have the fourth worst air accident in the world, and the Chief Executive gives the order to shed documents. Well, oh, it wasn't documents, it was surplus documents. Except, in two previous DC-10 incidents, Mann also found out in the inquiries the term surplus documents had come up, the shredding of surplus documents. <coughs> Incredibly, later, neither of the two dissenting judges on the New Zealand Court of Appeal, and even more incredibly, on the Privy Council in London, none of them saw anything sinister in this shredding of documents. Uh, ask yourself, why do you shred documents after the world's fourth worst air disaster unless you're hiding something? Why a cover-up? Well, probably, probably a bit of everything. A fellow last night said to me, I actually don't believe it was the money, I believe it was saving face. And you know, Muldoon was passionate about the airline. He saw the airline as New Zealand's face to the world. 
Uh, there were worries, I think, if the airline had been found culpable, its licences to fly in the States <coughs> could be reviewed by the FAA, the Federal Aviation whatever, Agency. Uh, there might have been a problem on future insurance. But if you follow the money, you get quite a good indication. If the pilots were to blame under the Warsaw Convention, now I think it's Montreal Convention, the New Zealand government were up for payments of no more than $42,000 compo per passenger. Uh, crew were covered by ACC. Passengers were not covered by ACC because the accident happened more than 300 miles offshore. Listen to ACC law in those days. So, if the pilots had were to blame, the government was up for $42,000 compo per passenger. If the airline was shown to be culpable, the claims are going to be unlimited millions. Unlimited millions. Indeed, I mean, multiply 230 by uh, 237 by, say, a million each. <laughs> Indeed, after Marne released its report in April 1981, by October of that year, the airline faced nearly $90 million of claims by relatives of the deceased. And Muldoon, going into election year, end of 1980, didn't want any of that nonsense happening in 1981. Marne said publicly later in Australia, and this is one of the most direct things he ever said about Chippendale, he more or less left Chippendale alone, really. Chippendale was a th you know, didn't matter to him. But he went to Australia uh, to speak to aviation lawyers in Sydney, a big meeting of aviation lawyers. He said the chief inspector's findings were nonsense, they were all based on hearsay, and they were all wrong. Most importantly, none of Chippendale's findings reflected what everybody knew of the reputations and the character of the two pilots. They were too good to be floating around down there, not knowing where they were, at 1,500 feet with a mountain in front of them. So Muldoon, upon Justice Mann's report being released, simply rubbished it. He's wrong. Muldoon knew. He's wrong. In which Mann declared, of course, this report, that he could not avoid saying he'd been forced to listen to an orchestrated litany of lies. As Sam Mann points out, I am a pentameter. His father did it quite deliberately. Orchestrated litany of lies. So powerful men now set out to destroy Mann, to discredit him in any way they could. Murray Davis, the chief executive, took Mann to the Court of Appeal. They said Mann should not have said that, uh, but two of the judges made it clear they believed Chippendale, really. They were Justices Woodhouse and McMullen, both of whom had close family ties to New Zealand. Justice Woodhouse's daughter was a public relations person for New Zealand. McMullen's son flew aircraft, and still does, for New Zealand. And apparently he's a very nice bloke, but there was a family connection. Mann then went off, and the reason they wouldn't allow, they reason that the, the, the reason they, the, the, the reason was quite good, really. He was royal commissioner, he was a judge, but he wasn't acting as a judge. And they said that what you've done in all trade of lies is you have convicted a group of people of conspiracy to perjure <coughs> without their having the protection of a jury. Not unreasonable. Damn good line, though. So Mann went off in a huff to the Privy Council. Several people advised him not to, because he was not going to win on law. And the Privy Council, of course, agreed with the Court of Appeal. Orchestrated litany of lies was a no-no. They say they found no evidence of a conspiracy whatsoever. God's sake. As Mann said later, well, what the Privy Council said was that while they all sang the same tune, they sang it as soloists, not as a choir. <laughs> But the council praised the judge no end. God, it's a peculiar judgment to read uh, the Privy Council. And, 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 and during the full flow of the writing of this book, sometimes you stare at print and you miss things. And I had reason to read the Privy Council judgment the other day. And it really is a peculiar judgment. They praise the brilliance of the, of the judge. But no, there's no conspiracy. He had no evidence of a conspiracy. It speaks of the thoroughness of the judge's investigation. A thoroughness that characterised the report, say the Privy Council. They placed on record, their lordships wished to place on record, their tribute to the brilliance of his investigation. They had no brief, of course, to decide Mann's findings on causation, whether they were correct or not, but they repeat Mann's findings of causation as if they themselves accepted them. They say the judge had ample evidence. It's a peculiar judgment. But the orchestrated litany had got him into trouble again. And this is what penetrated the public mind, that Mann had been overturned. That was the impression we all got. Overturned in the New Zealand Court of Appeal, overturned in the Privy Council. Murray Davis told me, he was straight in the face in 1994, at the time of the 15th anniversary of Erebus, now they are attending. 
Murray Davis was an incredible person. As Morris Williamson says to me, you know the thing about Murray, and Williamson worked at the the time, he remembers boxes of bloody documents going into the shredder. Well, there's even a person I think who works at New Zealand these days called Son of Shredder. <laughs> I don't know how to put that in the book. It seemed loose to me. One guy apparently says, Morris, again I can't verify this, lost his tie, got they cut his tie. <laughs> So, but the impression was, Lord of Bill and, and, and Privy Council had overturned him on causation. They did it. And in the book, you know, I include, it was very moving stuff that Margarita gave me from her box of Peter's papers. In the book, I've got correspondence from other judges praising Mahan for his report when it came out. One said, I just read it all night. Brilliant. Brilliant, Peter, what you've done. Just as Laurie Greg said that. It seems so easy to understand now, Erebus. But at the time, it was a nightmare of detail and obfuscation and obstruction. Bloody oath. But the book is really the story of the Collins family and how they were wounded so deeply, not only by the loss of a beloved husband and father, but how they endured his getting the blame when they knew him to be the most diligent of men. And then came the joy of man's findings, only to have Muldoon dump on the Royal Commission straight away. And that report was shut aside, sent to purgatory. And it was kicked out of the house for 20 years. And it wasn't until 1999 that report got tabled, in which the pilots are exonerated completely by the judge. But as I say, one of the reasons I started the book was to right an old wrong, because in the public mind, the matter remains confused, and I set out to try and clean it up. It was meant to be confusing, of course, the aftermath. It suited the airline, it suited civil aviation, the lot of them, for people not to understand the perfectly blameless performance of two fine pilots, long-time servants of the company that ditched them when they were dead and unable to defend themselves. You can second-guess this accident until the cows come out. It's really extremely simple. They're wonderful women, the Collins girls. They've spoken to me frankly. It's hard for them because they're very private. They opened their lives to me. Pip, the third daughter, kept saying, how much do I have to open this damn kimono? And I said, we stop talking like that. <laughs> I'm not going to sanitise and make you force some boring St. Helier's girls. You know, we'll read the book. But they opened their lives to me and they had a hell of a hard road to hoe and they had a hell of a hard road to hoe, not only in life, but in doing this book. They didn't know how people would react. Catherine told me about dreams she has had frequently over the years, in which her father comes to her. For example, Catherine wanted to go to, um, either wanted to go to Antarctica last year, oh, in, in November 09, 30 years. She so wanted to go. But mother said, Catherine, if the unbelievable were to happen again, you'd be leaving a husband and four children. And that night, Catherine says to me, late at night, five doors slammed unaccountably in her house. And that night, in her dreams, her father came to her and said, you look after the living, Catherine, because her girl had an exam the next day. You look after the living. And she was worried to those, and I put that in the books, that people would think I'm a nut burger. I said, we all have dreams, Catherine. And it's, and it's beautiful. She has this amazing connection with a dead loved one, Catherine. They survived. They're courageous. Their stories will inspire readers, I think. And Marguerite of Marne is a lovely, lovely character. The wife of Justice Peter Marne. They're all daughters of Erebus. And their stories are, as I say, deeply affecting. I set out, ladies and gentlemen, to do two things. To reveal the characters of the Collins girls, and Marguerite, and Peter Marne. God, what a wonderful man. And how the tragedy affected everyone. But my aim, as I said right at the start, was to spell out clearly and simply, once and for all, so that every New Zealander can understand, every one of us, because we all own this story, to set out and do it in such a way that everyone can understand what happened to that aircraft that cruel and fateful day. And my book starts with a letter to the Members of Parliament of New Zealand for a clear motion of exoneration, out on its own, of the two pilots. Thank you very much for coming along, and thank you very much for hearing me out and for listening to me.
Observation on board of Perks and Starlift is in Antarctic. I can tell you that both aircraft uh, have a thing called a chart table with instruments and indeed a man dedicated to their use. Such a thing does not exist Correct. on uh, neither the um, jumbos today, yeah. Yeah. neither do it, does such a thing exist on the Airbus A380s that we fly in. Yeah, no, the, um, no, the plotting table had gone from budget by that stage, that's right. Yes. Because you had a nav section. But you didn't need to second guess. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they checked and checked and checked and checked again. Except they didn't on this particular one thing. Well, why did they? Ordinance is amazing. Um, anyway, but it's in the book. I was going to ask you about coordinates. That seems to be pivotal to a whole deal. Has any endeavour been made? to identify the person that changed the coordinates. Oh, well, well, well. Got it. You mean originally or on the night? Originally. Okay, so we'll do the song as well. Yes, I do have the original. Okay, here's my two-minute version. One-minute version. Well, could you use the microphone? Oh, I'll use the microphone. Oh, yes, they're quite handy things. I'll spend my life with them. <laughs> <laughs> you can reach people. <laughs> Sell them stuff. Olive oil. <laughs> How'd I get into that? <laughs> the original destination coordinate when the flights were first instigated with approval of CAD in 1977, February, was 166, something like that, something like that, 166 um, degrees longitude east. That took you about a kilometre to the left of the very summit of Erebus. Two flights went on that, and I think that was in February 1977, two flights in late 77 went on that. There were no flights early 78 for some reason. Mid-1978, New Zealand, as the rest of us were doing, is computerising. The chief navigator then put the Antarctic flight plan into the computer. In doing so, he made a little one-digit error in the minutes, I think, but that's not important. The real mistake was, he always said it was a mistake. Man spent months pondering whether it was a mistake. He put in, instead of 166 degrees longitude east, he put in 164. That had the effect of moving the aircraft 27 miles to the west by the time he got down to the top of McMurdo Sound. So when he, the aircraft rolled right at Cape Hallett, the, way at the, top of, the top arm of Antarctica, close to us, when he rolled right towards McMurdo, it stopped, he rolled... Bye bye. <laughs> it stopped rolling two degrees short. No, sorry, went extra. Didn't it? Went extra. Extra degrees. So, that put him straight down the window. Now, what a mistake, Marn said. What a brilliant mistake to have made. He was infinitely safe than flying over an exploding volcano, for God's sake. And plus, you're 20 miles inside of it when you're going down the window of the sound. Nice way to come in and approach the window and stop that. For all the flights of 1978 and all the flights of 1979 except Jim Collins's, that's the route they all took. Management said they didn't know about it. A week before Collins, or two, a week before, two weeks before Collins goes, a captain comes back, Captain Simpson. He phones one of the briefing captains, Captain Ross Wilson, and says, Ross, one, I think we should make sure you thank the Americans for the help they give us down there. And two, um, that uh, destination waypoint is actually about 27 or 30 miles west of um, McMurdo. And I just think you should tell the guys about it in case they think their equipment's mad. You know, just... Um, Wilson, not Wilson. Who did I say? Ross Wood, Ross? Simpson. Huh? No, we're Captain Simpson, he was the pilot. Anyway, he phones as Ross, like Captain Ross Summer. He says, you know, I think you should tell the guys that coordinate is to the west of the middle, so they don't panic. He then goes to the navigation section and says there's something wrong with the McMurdo coordinates, fix it. He then 
it makes us, the chief navigator thinks that he's being told to change the minutes, not the degrees. He sends word that the coordinates need to be realigned as a blah, blah, blah. It goes to the computer boy over at Newton in Auckland, who in the middle of the night pulls out the original flight plan and puts the 166 back in. Even though Colin's been briefed for the 164. It's easier in the book. But that's how it happened. Cock up, cock up, cock up. There are actually about 11, about 11 navigation mistakes, but that one key one is a 166. The 166 was aiming to the Tacan beacon at yeah. Millyfield. That's right. Yeah. Yes, that was direct to McMurray. Yeah, right over the top of your Right over the top of your Sir. Uh, Paul, I just want to echo what your colleague said to you on Q&A about a couple of weeks ago, that this was a God-given task. Thank you. And I think you ran upstairs and very pleased with what you've done. Thank you. He rang me and he told me he was going to do that. <laughs> oh, sir. Oh, Christ, Johnny, can't do that. You might have been able to do it at home, but you can't do it on this bloody program. <laughs> My, my question is, having got halfway through the book, and obviously you've been, you know, certainly persuaded by your lucid, very lucid and clear arguments, the question I have is, is there any chance, uh, following the 30th anniversary, when you know the Collins family were sitting in the front and that type of thing, is there really any chance that New Zealand will bring themselves to issue a formal apology to both the Collins and Cassie family? Well, I would think that Ross Fyfe, uh, Rob, Rob, Rob Fyfe was probably ready to tip over on the 30th anniversary, but I would imagine his board balked. I don't know. In the end, he keeps the party line, but I have spoken to him. It's an enlightened, I know a couple of senior people there now. As a matter of fact, um, a month before this, I... Rob Fife and his, a couple of his team actually came down to the farm because they get on very well with them. And we're all sitting in the spa pool. And I don't know if you read wines. And I said, I think it's only fair to tell you what. Because <laughs> I'm doing a book on Erebus, eh? <laughs> no, about the girls, Collins girls. Oh, that's good, Collins girls. So that's 18 months ago, right? So about a month before this book comes out, I get on the plane to Auckland from Napier, and there he is, brutally dressed as always, Rob Fife. I said, well, come and join me, and so we take off, and he comes and sits next to me. I said, you know that book I told you about? He yeah, held it to him out. I said, well, it became a bit more than I intended. <laughs> he said, oh. I said, look, um, I said, Rob, they were bloody loose, Rob. He said, yeah. So, that's why they ended at Parliament, not at any sort of, I think they've probably gone as far as they feel they can. Morris Williamson, when I first got onto this project, I, I said to him, this is what I want to do, I want an exoneration. Yeah, that's great. No, I never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> they like that. Um, but he said to me um, um, that Crown Law had advised him that any Zealand has no legal jeopardy if they were to come clear. But I think a subtle way of doing it is for the government, which was the complete owner of any Zealand at the time, to issue that statement. Now I know that would make Maria and the girls happy. And Greg and his wife Anne and the girls happy. One of Greg Cousin's girls, Maria, actually, flies to New Zealand. Based in Christchurch. Yeah, well thank you for that. I mean it's not rocket science. A fellow stood up at a meeting the other day. He'd come along with a satchel full of Erebus books. I've flown 30,000 hours! I said, well, a lot of the people in Sports and Collins have flown 30,000 hours too. He says, Peter Margaret said four minutes before impact, I can't see anything. And that's the literality of what he's saying. Is I'll, I'll let you know what I know exactly because he just came back in the cockpit after doing the chat. I mean, I think if, if they 
Well, one thing that Chippendale did genuinely query quite sensibly was, well, what are your safety provisions if something goes wrong? Mm -hmm. See, um, Arthur Cooper, who was the transcribing pilot in Washington, DC, and Tony Bell, Arthur uh, said, well, he said to me two things. When I first went to see him, in Manawa 2, he said to me, retired, 75 now, 76, he said, he said, Paul, if those quarters hadn't been changed and Jim not told, we wouldn't be having this discussion 30 years on. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Pilots knew. But uh, one of the things he said to me was, he said, I, I, said, I never applied for one of those flights. He said, I didn't think we should have DC teams hanging around up down there. You see, uh, if anything went wrong, uh, I don't think the ice could have borne the weight of the all up weight of the DC 10. Um, that part would have had to keep power on um, because no one was equipped for anything colder than the last November or February day. No one had any luggage. Um, there were no um, cold weather emergency gear for, that, for anyone on board. Um, the Americans didn't even keep a marine search and rescue. Go into the water there, you couldn't miss. Um, the Americans couldn't have provisioned them. Uh, they flew clean, you know. One of the things that uh, they were going, you know, going down, they flew clean, meaning no flaps, no flaps. Because if they froze, you might not be able to withdraw them. Therefore, you wouldn't be able to get to altitude to come home. Therefore, you wouldn't have enough fuel. I think they actually did a calculation of coming back on one engine with the flaps out of 10,000 feet or something, and you, you, you crash 10, 15 minutes out of Christchurch. So, I mean, that's the annoying thing. Is there's no reason why, you know, we fly to South Africa, for example, which is a wonderful destination. And our rugby boys have to do it all the time, but it's great. But, you know, it's a miserable trip. Sydney, Perth, Johannesburg, and so forth. Whereas you could go direct from Auckland straight on the South Pole to Africa. But I think the reason they don't do it is because you're out of radio contact for about two or three hours. It's so that French people. Yeah, they fly the North Pole. They do, they do, sir. Yeah, that's right. But then, um, do they lose radio contact? I wonder. No. No, that's a, spe that's a spectacular pole of flying, isn't it? It's wonderful. We've got time for one more question, mm. if anyone would like to, sir? Yeah, um, you, you've been accused, and I know a book review I wrote from the local paper here, of being man's man through and through, but uh, um, I made that up, but perhaps you'd like to confirm or deny it. Well, I am man's man through and through, I know he made little errors. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've got to say, you know, I've, I've, um, you know, I've spent my professional life negotiating quite good, expensive contracts. I used lawyers to negotiate for me as my bargaining agent. My mother worked for a firm of very good lawyers for 25 years. I have respect for legal minds and legal training. I did extremely well with lawyer, very good lawyers negotiating my contracts. You know. I have respect for that mind, that kind of mind. And the more I read of man, the more I came to simply adore that mind. Mm -hmm. And then I picked up a copy of Sam Man's book about his father, uh, which I recommend. Have you read it? My Father's Shadow. Beautiful. One of the loveliest books about New Zealand you've ever read, actually. And uh, I, I, I read that and I, and I rang him. I got his number from Catherine. And I rang him. I said, Paul Holmes here, Sam. I just, oh, hello. He's an artist, lives in North Canada. He said, I said, look, I'm going to write a book to try and get Collins exonerated. He said, what a noble thought. I said, I've just read your book about your father. Oh, God, have you? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, I just want to tell you how wonderful it was. He said, well, God knows I'm the last person who should have written it because I knew nothing about it. <laughs> but when I started to read Vertigo on Erebus, you know, I thought, this is really challenging. Damn it, what is he saying there? Why is he saying that? Why is he saying it in this way? Um, I thought, do I have to read you between the lines? For example, Captain Gemmell was the chief pilot. Oh, here's the other thing, here's the other thing, Chippendale did. Public enemy number two. <laughs> Chippendale either appoints or gathers to him on the very moment when he first heads to Antarctica the day after the crash, and New Zealand's chief pilot. And this chief pilot is wandering around the crash site. A senior representative of the most interesting party in the whole thing. He went to McDonald Douglas with Chippendale, he became Chippendale's chief, or as Mann said, possibly only technical advisor. They engineered the, they engineered the Chippendale report. No doubt about it. Um, but, for example, he talks about Gemmell coming into the Royal Commission. 
And he says, I knew he reminded me of someone. And then I realized it was field, the 20th century's most brilliant commanding general, Field Marshal von Manstein. I go, what? I've never heard of this joke. And I've heard of a viewer. So I googled von Manstein. I find out he was brilliant. He got would have got to Leningrad. He had to halt the. He had to. He had to stop before Leningrad because the others for the other Germans to catch up with him. He nearly relieved Stalingrad. But he was head up for war crimes after the war, and his conviction is for not caring enough about civilian casualties. And that told me what Mum was talking about: the Collins family, the Cassin family. That's, and, 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 and so I'm thinking, you'll read between the lines of this joke. And then I pick up Sam's book again. And I see the introduction. Sam says, with my father, he never said anything clearly. You had to read between the lines. <laughs> so I'm intrigued with him not just as a brilliant legal mind. And he was loved by his colleagues. A couple of a bitchy to him. I don't know why. But he was loved. I mean, the letters from people like Anand Satchanan, Sean Elias, which I published in the book, when I was trying to get him a knighthood. They adore him. Um, so I'm fascinated by him as a legal mind, but as a man of honesty and integrity, uh, and a man of subtlety. So yeah, I'm rather man's man. <laughs> would like to purchase a copy of Daughters of Erebus, it's 39.99, and Paul is going to take a seat just up here, and um, he will be signing books, and if you have any other questions, feel free to come up and talk to Paul. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Yes, thank you.